This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, so it is another week of a crazy amount of stuff packed into all of the episodes. There's probably going to be two RPG episodes this week. If you don't get it around to uh, catching them, then, you know, they'll be around for a little bit. Uh, one will be, the first one will be all the stuff that's in April, and then everything left over from April and into May. This episode will get through all the stuff in both April and May. It's currently out. Fun fact, I saw a thing, I was going on Board Game Geek, and there was a guy, and he was like, oh, I'm doing all the Kickstarters. And I looked, and he only did 18. And I think we do... I think last week like 80 <laughs> so um yeah they're 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 false advertising i don't know maybe i'll change up the way that the uh the links work or the titles work so people can see like no nah, man there's there's a lot more going on you there is full opportunity for you to find your favorite game uh every week all kinds of stuff is popping up and it pops up in different price levels it pops up in different types so if you wanted to play a miniatures game, but you can't afford it, so maybe there's a standees game that's really similar, and those things come through every week, and it could be the thing that, uh, you know, gets you to have more friends come over and play with them, and you buy a social deduction game later, and you can get 10 people over, and all that kind of cool stuff. So um, all those different experiences, they can pop up and happen, and I'd like you guys to have all of those experiences, and I'd like to have them too. Let's experience everything this week. Let's get started. And the first one we have up is one that you might have missed because it had a really short campaign, so contact them for a late pledge. This is Aventuria Epic Adventures and Extraordinary Heroes, and it takes place in something called The World of the Dark Eye, which is the number one selling RPG setting in Germany. It's also been around since the 80s and has been a continuous world since then. So uh, they say it's the longest running. It's hard to say, I mean, first edition second edition third edition they still have players it's hard to say which ones are still around they have third party market all that kind of stuff whatever the case is this is a world for um not just people in germany but i'm sure it's very popular there but other places in europe probably know more about it and um that's a big part of the market about 50 percent of the people that go to kickstarter uh, and whenever you look at these campaigns, it's like 50% from the U.S. English speaking, and then 50% from um, Europe, and then it trickles in from Asia and uh, Africa. But uh, you know, card art looks good. It looks like it um, fits pretty well into a fantasy uh, setting. It's something that will feel familiar. But especially if you're the type of person that uh, I think this is going to go more for like. Uh, a caliphate or something more Middle Eastern as far as the uh, storyline goes but you can play it solo if you haven't been able to play an RPG by yourself you can use these type of rules and uh, you won't have to grab a party so that part works pretty well then we have Poetry Slam which is a little different um, you're gonna be given a prompt with a random letter and that random letter will appear in a position so you could say the second letter is V and then you write down a word that fits that description the faster you are at that then you're able to go and start grabbing these things called speed tiles and that will help you as you continue through the rest of the um the game making poems uh and you can see what the the grading is how many letters you're able to grab how many words and things you're able to complete um the higher you go the more points you get and it's it's gonna run that way so uh, people that are big scrabble fans highly literate very very helpful if your spelling is off though i'm not sure how it, it factors into that the older i get the less i'm able to care about the spelling of things i i, I think i'm just getting lazy from the autocorrect i'll put it in what i think it'll be and then let the autocorrect fix it this is a challenge to those types of mentalities so uh, maybe it'll get me back into my old uh ways of being able to spell everything right uh, i'd have to be competitive when i used to work for mattel we worked on the Game Boy version of Scrabble, and uh, we had to learn all the words in dictionary in order to do the job right. So maybe that'll all come back. If you've had a similar spelling bee type experience, maybe you'll enjoy this game. Then we have a game that says that it is uh, handmade out of wood, but it's obviously laser cut in a lot of spots. I don't know if you can call that hand, uh, but you know, it's a game. The idea is you have all these different Tetris style pieces, and you're going to be placing them in a variety of ways. And your goal is to get all 14 of your pieces on the board. 
and as many as you can make it happen, they will be scored uh, when they're flipped over uh, at the end. If you are able to block your opponent from being able to place anything that they want to place, and you can get all your high um, point value uh, tiles up there, that is how the game should work. And uh, it looks pretty neat. Uh, it comes in its own carrying uh, box. It's played as a board and a box at the same time. Um, yeah, I don't think it necessarily needs to be made out of wood, but it does make it a little easier for, uh, I guess, the folks making this to uh, ship it to you. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure a plastic or uh, cardboard one would be just as effective, but uh, wouldn't look as nice and wouldn't have that uh, burnt wood smell, I'm sure. Then we go from one of the smallest campaigns to definitely the biggest. This is Mythic Battles Ragnarok. It takes two to four players. It is a skirmish adventure game that takes place in a world with uh, Norse uh, stuff going on. You can see the Yggdrasil Pet Pledge, and there's a bunch of other... Um, gods, monsters, heroes, all that kind of cool stuff available in the game. And you can take this into Mythic Ban Battles Pantheon as well, as far as I'm uh, aware, and you can take it in, in even into Conan. So if you were to pick up this game now and you were um, you wanted to use the pieces to play in Conan, then they're going to send you a separate set of tiles that's very similar to the way that the... Um, there was like an ultimate monolith uh, game that they wanted to create across all of their, their product lines and it didn't do as well because it confused a lot of people as to um, having the uh, how what they needed to, to purchase. It was tied in with Batman and it was tied in with Conan and it was tied in with Mythic Battles and it was tied in with all this stuff. And I think the product lines confused people so much that even myself and a bunch of other folks went out and tried to make videos to help people understand what they needed to buy and then the second all those videos came out they went under uh, they canceled the whole thing so it seems like they're bringing it back to life but in a more measured uh, way if you're into Norse stuff you're into Viking stuff you definitely want to look at this then we go from a mythical battlefield to one that is just hardcore fictional Love and Barbed Wire is a letter writing game where you're going to be a soldier and then someone they love and you're be going to be given these uh, playing cards and that will determine how the war is going. So I think it's got a lot of vibes like this war of mine. Um, you can go light, you can go dark, you can go funny. It's going to depend on you and the crowd that you're with. Um, if you are trying to be super eloquent, um, I wouldn't have the high level of expectations that a Ken's Burn docu documentary recreation of the uh, words that those people said to their loved ones back and forth because um, I'm going to guess, never been in the military, but I'm going to guess when they're writing their stuff that they're talking with a bunch of other people like, hey, what should I put down in this? What sounds good? And uh, when you're at home on a, a clock with a timer that says you got like two minutes to write something nice you are not going to have that level of uh critique and uh and nuance to <laughs> what it is that you have to say so uh i think it'll still be kind of fun it's a role play e experience but it's not necessarily something that you can judge easily it's going to be how thoughtful the other person thinks you are and and that can be hard to quantify not hard to quantify is that Australia is a big ass place and it has lots of interesting creatures in it and it would be great if uh, it was attacked by Lovecraftian beasts such as the great old one himself and that's what you can get here. Um, this is two new expansions for Australia. You can actually get a big old box with all of it including the base game if you wanted to. Uh, comes with organizing trays and all kinds of cool stuff. If you are into um, big Nyarlathotep uh, and uh, Cthulhu and other crazy stuff. The Revenge of the Old Ones is the expansion for you. Um, and then the rest of it is a Tasmania expansion that has all kinds of cool things that you can explore because it is mainly an exploration game um, even if you don't want the uh, Lovecraftian elements thrown into it. And I'm sure it's a lot of fun uh, with all the crazy wildlife and things that can be found there. Then we go on to another storytelling game. This is Partners, and this is supposed to be evocative of 80s cop dramas and procedurals. 
which is kind of cool. It uses a uh, set of playing cards to randomize how things will run through the plot. Um, but instead of the GM making the story for you and this, that, and the other thing, the players are actually going to collectively decide what the evidence is, where it points to, and um, the randomness will lead you to the next uh, zone or area, uh, maybe the next suspect. And uh, it's an interesting concept. You'll have to be working with somebody who is interesting, someone who can play the good cop or the bad cop. And uh, that makes it feel much like a lot of those Miami Vice type of uh, 80s cop drama. So check it out if you're into that kind of thing and if you have somebody that wants to be your partner. Next up is a miniatures game full of things you would find in the Coliseum, such as gladiators and animals to fight them. And uh, they are some pretty cool miniatures. It's hex grid. Um, and so I don't know if you'll be able to put it with a bunch of other games. These are fairly popular styles of games, these arena ones. Um, the minis on this one have been some of the better ones that I've seen over the last two or three years. And uh, that part is pretty cool. Comes with a bunch of, um, uh, you know, the, the standard six-sided dice, the standard uh, little blocks and that type of thing. If you wanted to expand it out, you can. Uh, but they're going to work pretty hard on keeping a lot of the terms that are traditionally in Latin also accessible. That was something that they wanted to make um, really easy for folks who speak English, even though this is coming out of Italy. And uh, I'm wondering, maybe that's going to add a little level of authenticity. If any of you are experts in uh, Rome and the Colosseum, maybe you'll be able to uh, help us out understanding that. But they've got a lot of uh, instruments that you typically see. I don't know necessarily in uh, if it was for the Colosseum, but in the movies about it, uh, man catchers, nets, uh, tridents, all that kind of cool stuff, different types of armor. Check out the page just to see all the cool different uh, sculpts because there's quite a few uh, interesting poses and types of armor for the different stylized gladiators. And then we have a game of scarcity for the environment. This is Green Guardians and uh, it's going to be made out of pieces that are wood and other things that are um, as low in carbon footprint as possible. This is a trend that a lot of folks uh, have been moving towards, but I would still say it's a, a fair uh, minor, very small minority of um, people that are advertising that they're trying to make small uh, carbon footprint on uh, the making of uh, board games. Usually uh, paper and cardboard materials aren't as uh, heavy uh, these days because a lot of it can be recycled. So that part's pretty cool. But what are you going to do with all this information? You're going to try to save the world and there's going to be crises such as the water disaster with different levels and you're going to have to figure out ways to solve pollution, make people happy, be prosperous at the same time. The same types of things that people have to deal with now. You can get different abilities uh, and breakthroughs like biodiversity and uh, hydropower, solar power and that kind of fun stuff. So uh, I think it's interesting if you're going to be having a science class or you're going to be teaching about climate change. The next three or four years will probably be a lot going on uh, positively for that uh, direction and uh, we'll see how it all goes and uh, maybe it'll be a good way to teach your kids things that they can do and not scare them about the concept. One thing they should be scared of is the most fearful sacrifice, three days of Gettysburg and the uh, being so far away, it's been over 150 years at this point since this battle took place and a lot of the sting and lessons have been lost to time and uh, people that play these types of games, maybe they'll have a, more of a connection to it, more of an understanding of the tactics. Uh, the wooden pieces have uh, been painted so that they're uh, showing off the different units and they've got the names of the folks that were there. And uh, that part is pretty cool about being uh, rec a uh, good recreation, recreation. That's what I try to say. Not recreational, but recreational um, uh, version of the of the battles that had gone on. Um, there's a reason why it's so famous, why that address was made, and why everything was so bloody. You're not going to get the cannon fire that you see there in the, the graphic, but Flying Pig has been working pretty hard on uh, Kickstarters the last few years trying to get some nice pieces out there and I remember there was one not too long ago of them I think trying to save the company basically and uh, get more war games out by doing Kickstarter and uh, if they're able to uh, continue then uh, I'm glad so far they've been successful and hopeful 
that uh, the 14 campaigns that people have enjoyed so far will continue to be enjoyed on this 15th. Then we have a game called Scrumpy. Uh, this is about cider. Um, there's, I think, too many jokes <laughs> here that are going on. This is their first time creating a game. Uh, they've been successful so far. I think it was because of the strength of the art and the cards, uh, how well it all goes together. I don't think that a lot of people are going to be able to kn know whatever the, it is they're referring to by scrump and how that goes to cider. But cider is delicious. I drink it more often than I drink beer, to be honest with you, because there's a, a lot of different flavors and I like trying all the different ones. And we have a cidery and a meadery uh, right up the street, uh, the Honest Abe, and uh, there's a SoCal cidery companies. They make delicious stuff if you have the opportunity to try it out, especially the citrus stuff, really good. You get storehouses, workers, skilled workers, and other cool stuff that you need in order to have the best um, bits that you can, uh, the best outputs. This has a solo mode as well. Um, there's a lot of meeples and things in here. Uh, there are a few meeple upgrades that you can pick up in other campaigns that maybe we'll utilize here. But really, it's about uh, foraging, it's about mashing stuff down, it's about making that cider happen and uh, placing orders and fulfilling them. And you even get a first player marker as a barrel, so that part is pretty neat and you might be able to use it somewhere else. Uh, they say it's going to even be made out of wood, so, you know, that's a neat thing to have. Then we have a game that needs some explanation, and I th think that is because they have had um, a very poor choice in name. The uh or if you see C-O-F-F-I in English, the first thing you might think of is coffin. You're probably not going to think of coffee. Um, they're trying to be too cute with this. And I think that is because the C-O-F-F, -F, had they left one of those Fs off, maybe that would work here. Uh, and they could tell me to F off. I don't care. Um, the uh, idea here is you're going to be going around and trying to create different beans and match them up. And uh, that will allow you to grow more, it'll allow you to sell more, roast more, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, it is uh, like a math game because there's roast multipliers that you can do and you get different barista scores to go along with it depending on how you set up your matches. And I think it might actually be fun, it's supposed to play in 10 or 15 minutes and that's good for people on their coffee break to be able to play it. But like I said, the second you see the title, you might not click on it because you might think it's not about a caffeinated beverage, but instead about uh, being six feet under just because of the word association that's tied with it. Um, but if they've already got everything made, then that's what you got to live with. I'm talking about board game upgrades. How about deluxe board game train sets? And um, these are some good looking plastic pieces uh, of miniature trains that you can use in any of the other train games that have come out. Um, they're not the type that are going to be on a track, but they are the type that uh, are very close to how a lot of those engines look. Um, different time periods, different styles, diesel, coal, depends on what you're looking for. Uh, come in many colors, you can check it out and see if it will be a nice addition for the game that you want to play with these. They have made over $150,000 with 2,200 backers plus so I know there's a lot of people out there that are have a train game in mind that this would be perfect for. And, uh, you know, why not have the best uh, possible stuff? If you've enjoyed a game and you played it a lot, uh, you bought it for the discounted price uh, of not having premium components for at retail or whatever. And uh, now it's time to give it a little bit more love with uh, one of these sets, if you so choose. Speaking of trains, let's take them to somewhere they don't normally go, and that is into a fantasy setting. So this is Imperial Far Corners. This is Spells and Steam. Uh, the idea is you're going to have a company, and you're going to have different strengths and weaknesses depending on what you've got, and you're going to run off of a fantasy hex grid, delivering resources and improving your abilities as best you can. And, you know, you could get bored with the same old um, historical versions of how... Uh, steam is applied to rail and uh, how goods and services are moved around different countries and this is a good way to spice things up and still keep that same feel it's an understandable technology um, 
spells and stuff with worked really well in Arcanum, the video game. Uh, not a lot of people bought that, but the game was good. So I would say if you enjoy playing things that are steampunk, but you want things that are uh, more fantasy thrown into that, and uh, you don't want to play one of the other, like Ticket to Ride or other types of games, maybe this will be an upgrade to that, and uh, you can play with your RPG group as well. And maybe even talk some of them into playing some steampunk stuff if uh, they get used to it here. And then we have one of those campaigns where I got to show you something somebody did wrong, um, and that's why it's probably not doing as well. This is Gemshine Pylons, and uh, they didn't change the text of the tagline from when they were trying to get people hyped to when it became an actual Kickstarter. So the first thing you read after the name is click to be notified when the project goes live. The project is live. So it might make you wonder like, hey, do you know your project is live? Is this actually supposed to be live? Maybe you thought that the card art was neat or you like the idea of the different components. You want something that's um, like a bejeweled style game that's played off with these cards. But you don't know if these people are actually running the game. You don't really know if they're really running the, uh, the program. And um, that is not good. <laughs> you can't trust somebody's quality control if they didn't even look at their own page and read it. Um, and then take it down and fix it and then launch it again. You know, do something about it. So uh, this is not a way to build trust, uh, even if the game is good. And I think we've seen this game before, but maybe it's just because I've seen it in the queue for so long. Then we got a crazy game that takes all of the neon that um, was part of the Blade Runner world of uh, a Los Angeles based on Tokyo of the future with all the dark, gritty, noir elements and uh, makes a game out of it. You have to defend Tokyo by building an army, uh, the same type of things that you might have found in Neuromancer or one of the other Gibson books, throw in some ninjas to go with it, and... Uh, defend the districts as they appear it can be a little confusing honestly the way that the game plays just because there's so many colors and things going on um, this is standard if you ever read a Japanese newspaper uh, with advertisements they like clutter um, and that's a lot of colors a lot of things going on and that's kinda how it feels there's just so much uh, happening that uh, it feels like some of the pieces kind of get lost, but that is evocative of that um, that culture in how um, if you were to walk down those streets, like I lived in Korea for a year, uh, I've been in uh, to Japan, I've been to a few different places, and um, this type of color noise exists. So it fits pretty well, but it might be hard for some people to to take and understand and see what the game is about. Um, to make the effort if you're into this type of world because I think that they've nailed um, that uh, Neo Tokyo feel. And then you can take that Tokyo and have it smashed by monsters. The monster you build in Monster Stomping Heroes. This is very similar to Bears vs. Babies. Uh, if you played that one from the Exploding Kittens people where you were going to take um, arms and legs and heads and put them on bodies that have different abilities and then uh, have them fight against each other. Bears versus babies, you have them fight against the babies. Uh, and in Monster Stomping Heroes, you have a fight against um, the, a different city. It's an interesting idea. As you can see, there's um, things that have been inspired by Marvel. There's things that have been inspired by uh, maybe dinosaurs and other crazy things. So I think you'll find something that is part of a fandom of yours in one of these pieces. And I think one of my friends, her... She doesn't. She likes to play some of the games. Hard to get her to sit down and actually play the, any of the games. But she likes Bears vs. Babies. So um, I don't know if it's the aspect of building that goes along with it. The fact that there's no dice in it. Uh, whatever the case is, there are dice here. Um, but I think you might be able to get, because there's so many different fandoms represented, people that you can't normally get to the table to sit down and play and enjoy the experience of playing along with you in this type of game. And then we go to Greece with Symposium. And this is uh, based on Descended from the Queen. Uh, it's based on For the Queen by Alex Roberts. It's a storytelling card game where you are going to be a uh, person who 
is at a party, basically. If you played uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, one of the missions that you go on, you uh, are at a symposium and the people get drunk. You're supposed to like fake somebody being drunk so they can get out. It depends on your romance options, how it's all set up. But you would see what that situation is like. It's not just um, your friends hanging out. The idea was to have interesting people thrown together, having discussions with their ideas, and you can discuss various philosophies such as hedonism, sophistry, epicureanism, fabulousness, stoicism. You ask their question like, what is courage? What is it to be wise? You can make a speech in praise of love. Whatever the th card you draw, um, that's what you're going to try to represent uh, as a member of this um, dinner party and try to be interesting. I think even that one night in Miami would uh, be similar because it's a lot fewer people. It's only the three or four men that are uh, in that movie, which I've yet to see, but the idea is the same. You're all going to be stuck in the room together you know, discussing your philosophies, and I like that. 44-inch chest, if you haven't watched that one, I have seen that one. Very similar, and you should check that out too. And for the Monkey Island fans, we have Buccaneer Bay, and this is another trying to be funny, cartoony um, pirate game. I saw a couple other pirate games last week, week before. Maybe just spring is the time for piracy, uh, whatever the, that case is. It's all told with cards, so you don't have to worry about big boards or anything like that. Two players, you're going to uh, be able to shoot at each other. Um, you can bring your own shanties and yo-ho, yo-ho, blow the man down and bottles of rum as you want. Uh, that's your game. You did make that decision. The card art's okay. Um, it's not like super uh, sophisticated or anything like that, so it should be accessible for people that uh, are even younger. Um, you are going to get 15 pirate ships, uh, eight, six mother ships, and you're going to get 15 cannons and 10 captains to uh, fight your way back and forth against each other. And who knows? You might have fun. Two to six players, ages eight and up, says it plays pretty quickly, 10 to 30 minutes. So maybe you'll be able to get two or three in before your lunch break is up. And if you still need more ancient Greek in your life, how about Hippocrates? This is about medicine in the ancient Greek world. You get a bunch of cool different uh, medicine vials of different colors. You get different types of patients and uh, various doctors to go along with it. 30 different uh, doctor cards I see six areas that they're actually from, so Persia, Carthage, Macedonia, Alexandria, Greece, and uh, Serene, and the um, patients that would go along with it. And you're going to do your best. You uh, try to solve whatever it is, the problems that they have. You can get 60 metal coins to go along with it. If you want more types of metal coins, check in on the RPG episodes, because those are becoming popular again to uh, mint out for people. And uh, yeah. It's not like heavy on minis, you just have your different columns and uh, coinage and you do your best to uh, mix and match the different ingredients of the vials and uh, make it work. There's uh, some type of connecting uh, aspect that goes along with it that uh, determines whether or not you can do the healing and uh, you can watch uh, the tutorial playthrough. Uh, one of those guys that does all of the, um, the playthroughs has a pretty good explanation on there. Check it out. If you uh, like playing doctor games, but you want to change it, if you've been playing Clinic or any of those other ones, maybe you want to change up your uh, your theater of play, but have the same uh, concept uh, for success. Opposite the theme of healing, we have Murder, Mayhem, and Lollipops. This is a print and play edition. So if you have bought Joshua Mason's games before, you don't need it. But if you have had a hard time getting the games and you just wanted to make a less expensive version for yourself, then uh, he is creating new versions for you um, that you'll be able to pick up at a lower price. So check it out. If uh, there's been enough of a demand to uh, have it printed off, but maybe not enough to um, do a full print run with a bunch of backers and that kind of thing, then uh, this might be an opportunity if you pick something up. There are a bunch of other games that are on here. I see uh, like 18, <laughs> maybe 21 uh uh, different games that are available. Qtopia is the one that is the most recent from them. So if you were a backer before, you like this uh, iconography, um, then uh, maybe you'll check it out. And if you haven't been able to pick up the game before, you can now.
Then we got one of those games that tries to end relationships through honesty. This is TBH, the game of honest answers. It has some questions. It depends on you whether or not you find them to be outrageous. Uh, one of the ones here, as you can see the bottom right, was if you're running a marathon and the uh, you run through a swarm of moths that eat all your clothes, you're now naked, do you continue to run? I say yeah, because uh, I'm, I went to school in Santa Cruz. They had the naked run every year, and the first time it rained. And uh, everybody seemed to have a good time. Just hang out with your thing out. Uh, if you still got shoes on, if you are running through a city and it ate your shoes, then I would say maybe stop running. Um, if you discover a door in your basement that says humans welcome and you've never seen it before, do you go down in there? Well, have you seen Channel Zero all the seasons? Because maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, and something about uh, if you find out about JFK and aliens, now you have to be the president for four years. I don't know where that all ties in or what the how the question is set up, but uh, I would fix that question <laughs> or toss it out. So there's some are winners and some probably not, but that's with any game. It could be a lot of fun if you got people that can just rattle off hypotheticals. Um, you know, so I would otherwise suggest the conspiracy theory game if you don't have a group like, like that, because that game is a lot of fun, even though it can be difficult to find. And then we have the relaunch of Vowel. Uh, maybe four months ago this came out. Um, Obviously, it needed to be reworked or some expectations lowered. The idea here is um, you were given a lot of consonants and no vowels, and you have to figure out what the words are. So BCM, you could be become, right? Uh, maybe it's a different word. Maybe became. You decide the vowel. You can come up with whatever word that fits your uh, concept and, uh, you know, whatever's going on in your brain and... Hopefully you know a lot of words. So if you were playing Scrabble, like I said before, if you're playing a lot of the other uh, word type games out there, this may be an interesting one to test your ability to, um, I don't know, play Countdown. Uh, if you uh, watch that UK show with uh, Rachel Riley and uh, Jimmy Carr, uh, there's lots of different people that might enjoy this type of game that are out there. It's already... 99% funded, um, so if you picked it up now, you'll probably receive it, very likely, and uh, have a good time with the uh, uh, grammar nerds in your group. And then we got the first of a couple upgrade uh, types of uh, campaigns. This one is the board game Meeple Upgrades. As you can see for Scythe, they are, there's a lot of paint going on on these. Um, they all fit the same basic aesthetic, the way that they've been... Uh, drawn out. I don't know why it's not uh, like a $100,000, $200,000 campaign. Um, maybe because games like Wingspan and uh, Pandemic and Lords of Waterdeep, Feast for Odin, uh, many others. Scythe is represented here with all those expansions. Maybe they've um, already been satisfied in other campaigns um, or they're just very inexpensive. There's a lot of different games, though, that are here that you can pick up, um, upgrades for, and, you know, if you always just care about the color, maybe this doesn't work for you, but if you want something that just is painted real nice and, um, you know, sits on the table and you can recognize more of the character of, of the story uh, that's being told in the game using these pieces as opposed to just having the blank uh, colored meeple pieces it might make things more immersive and fun for you. And another upgrade is the Gloomhaven Frosthaven character locker and dashboard. Uh, you can see the different colors uh, represented there. It has an integrated space for the health trackers. Basically, it's a 3D printed piece um, that uh, makes it easier for you to keep track of all of the stuff you have going on in Gloomhaven that otherwise would crowd up your table. I personally have these neoprene mats to do the same job, uh, but they would not allow me to uh, store it later. Um, just put it all back in the box and remember, you know, what cards I'm using, what characters I'm using, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, and that's what this one is uh, allowing you to do with the locker function. So that part's pretty neat. Uh, it is a big game. Frosthaven will be just as big. I backed both, and I never get to play for Gloomhaven. It's probably been a year and a half since I've played it. Uh, I still look up at it, and I'm like, do I want to get that heavy box down and uh, and try to figure out how to play this again? And I do want to play it, but I'm, instead I'm making three videos a week all the time like this time. 
Then we have the cooking game of Head Chef, where you're going to be pulling uh, different ingredients and doing your best to create combinations with them that make satisfying meals for customers. It's a pretty simple idea. You uh, have been to a restaurant, I'm sure, and someone behind that uh, counter and behind that little window, behind the little bell, behind all the little stuff, and in front of a hot-ass grill is uh, making these things into food for you. So. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have also had the same experience of being behind that hot ass grill and you can explain those stories and share them or fantasize about being a fancy chef one day while you watch Hell's Kitchen or one of the other uh, bajillion uh, food network shows and cooking shows out there then uh, you can play this game as well or you just figure out how to play how you're gonna plan your dinner breakfast lunch that kind of stuff are you hungry now I'm hungry now and I think this is another one that kind of uh, suffers from the uh, name Mosdingto is supposed to be about mosquitoes. Um, I think it could be fun for people to play the role of the mosquito attacking other humans. Um, I'm sure people have bought bees, people have bought like uh, cockroach games, they've bought all these different types of pest games and uh, I don't see there's any reason why they wouldn't do the same thing. Um, they're, you're going to be attacking a sleeping human. You're going to be doing what you can to not wake them up and drain them dry as much as you can. Uh, that's the concept of the game. And um, there's uh, pack and ding that are going to have some type of significance. And I'm not sure if that's a Hong Kong thing or not, but in America they need a little bit more explanation or maybe some better choices um, as far as um, the descriptions to make people um, feel closer to those those words, but they seem to be significant in this game. Um, or maybe just sell in Hong Kong. I don't know. Uh, but I, like I said, it's not doing great, but I think that the concept of the game itself, the story of the game could be fun. Then we have Paw Cards, which is a matching game based on uh, cat feet. If you are a cat person, then maybe you'll get it. It's pretty simple. I mean, there's just a word that is a color, and then you match that to the type of paw. And um, you can read the rules right there if you want to. Uh, there are a lot of cat people out there in the world. Um, I, maybe this would be a fun game for a cat cafe. Um, if you haven't already set that kind of thing up, uh, or you know somebody that is just ridiculously into calicos and you don't want to play calico instead, which is, I think, an uh, American Game of the Year, uh, or the American Game Association's Game of the Year for his calico. If you want to play something, you know, a little simpler uh, with somebody, then maybe you can do that here. I'm trying to come up with some options. They're all up to you. Um, there's some mixing and matching and all that kind of fun stuff going on without the sneezing. Then we have a Monopoly style game of property trading. This is World Tycoon. And the thing that they're trying to say is that Monopoly typically just uses the uh, outside of the board, whereas this one is going to use the whole board, interior, exterior, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, you would look at it and you see all these um, pieces of the world and they look pretty cool and then you go look at the actual board and it is as bland as possible. You don't care anymore. So uh, they definitely need to get some art going on onto the board itself. Um, uh, even if it was just you know regular sketched, not doesn't have to be photos or anything like that. Um, doesn't have to be much more complicated than, than uh, just outlines of the places that they're showing off. But something needs to be there or else there's not going to be um, more than the 24 backers that are already on it. Even if it's a mock-up saying that this is not the final board. Something like that because it just looks too bland. And that's probably keeping people away from it. And then one thing you might know about animals is they get hungry and then they eat each other. This is Hungry Life. This is a 2-5 to five player game for ages 8 and up about hungry animals in different parts of the world so Europe is broken off differently than North America you get a bunch of different animals and uh, there's 125 in total cards which includes 
different types of projects, different types of plants, natural events, and other cool things that could happen in the real world to affect those animals. Um, it's an interesting educational uh, game That's if you were going to be playing it uh, with a younger person you could. Otherwise, um, it's saying ages 8 and up, so what's that, like second or third grade? And uh, at least here in America it would be third grade. I think it'd be fine while they're sitting there learning cursive and multiplication and all that kind of stuff. They could learn about squirrels with big old ears that they don't see in their state um, or different types of cats and beetles and other stuff. Uh, animals are very regional because temperature is very regional and um, you know they adapt to the things that are around them, not the things that are someplace else. And uh, I think it's a really interesting way to explore um, the world by locking uh, into, you know, we're going to learn, learn at what how European animals are different or, or similar to uh, North American ones. So let's check it out in this game. Um, great for science classes, learning at home, whatever you want to do. And then we have a historical recreation game that is similar, I would say, to the way that some of the war games are designed. Um, it, the guy Dan Bullock that has designed it has done war games. Uh, one was No Motherland Without, the North Korean game for Compass Games. And they make a bunch of other stuff as well as uh, In the Shadows for French Resistance. This time it's the 1979 revolution in Iran. Uh, it's the Islamic revolution where they changed into a theocracy. Um, and you get uh, different factions. Um, as you can see here, it shows the components to it, such as an economic crisis. There's um, uh, whatever Seddon files unearthed are, <laughs> uh, different things. Put on Argo and uh, you know play along, have a full night of things that happened uh, as a result of this. I'm, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm not from Iran and I wasn't around in 1979 enough to be aware. Uh, I was basically Adams at that point, and that's it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't want to insult anyone who had to come over from there. I got friends whose uh, family members are, are currently over there right now, having a hard time of things. So, um, I'm not going to give too much commentary other than the knowledge that this game exists. And if you are interested in this type of history, then maybe give it a shot because the designer has made games uh, like this before. And before we had talked about bears versus babies as a game, this is bees versus bears. You play the bees and they play the bears. So, um, yeah, the, you're going to be against the game doing what you can to create the best defense possible. I don't know how you would defend against the bear dressed as a spooky ghost or um, all the other crazy things. One of them could be magnetic. There's lots of different ideas going on in this game that is very whimsical and fun. Um, very campy and uh, not taking itself too seriously, which is great. It's not quite the oatmeal for artwork, um, but uh, I think it's got a, a, a possible fun good time going on there, uh, being the reverse of Bears vs. Babies, now the Bears vs. the Bees. Uh, I think it would fit pretty well on the shelf next to it, so you can just pick what decision, you know, what uh, faction you want to be, and then you know, go from the bear. And uh, don't forget to rub it t its tummy, because they are so cute. I do like bears. I do want to rub their tummies. Then, if uh, animals aren't your thing, um, but you do want to attack a bunch of people that are also at the table with you with uh, various implements that you find out there in the wilderness then maybe Board Game Royale is for you. This is a new and improved version. Um, they've uh, changed some things up from the first printing. They've added 20 new cards uh, to be used as weapons and resources. And uh, basically, you're going to uh, MacGyver and Home Alone your way through <laughs> uh, the competition. Um, they've added a Wild Hunt um, group with animals and fun stuff in it. They've also have uh, zombies and um, uh, skills you can add and different ways for you to help yourself survive. This is just one of those weird games that throws all those what-if scenarios into um, into one box for you. I think it'd be fun uh, if you can get people that are also uh, competitive, collaborative, and imaginative all at the same time. It has done pretty well for itself, even for being a second edition at uh, over 1,300 backers. And it's only going to go up from there. Um, I'd love to see some more playthroughs and that kind of stuff and ideas from people. 
but it might be one to, to keep an eye out for as uh, being a game that can expand pretty far and still be pretty fun having uh, the idea of what would you do in this situation of being stuck on an island and you have to fight for your way out. And then we have an interesting deduction game called Treasure of Igneous Island that is best described, in my opinion, as a pirate-themed version of Minesweeper. The uh, game used to play when you weren't playing Solitaire, Killing uh, Time and Windows. Yeah, I think that's what it really is. You have uh, 144 tiles, so it's a 12 by 12 board, and on each of the tiles there is uh, some type of treasure somewhere, and you have to figure out where the golden treasure is out of all of them. It's an interesting concept. It's an interesting idea. It teaches uh, logic and um, deduction and all that kind of fun stuff. It's supposed to be used for students in problem solving and should be able to help uh, times tables up to 12 as well. So yeah, third grade and above, I would say, would be a good time. It's only been up for a couple hours, uh, so it doesn't have a lot of backers right now, but um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's got an ambitious goal, but uh, I think we'll see, be seeing it again for a second or third round soon. And then we have a toned down version of Nemesis. This is Xeno Hunters. This is sci-fi semi-cooperative board game uh, that doesn't have all the crazy miniatures, but it does have some nice art. Um, it does make you feel like it's out there in a sci-fi world. Uh, you can be a medic, an engineer, a scientist, or a soldier, and that part is all pretty cool. You have a uh, hidden location board that uh, you try to figure out where um, you, you got to keep it secret from the other players and then uh, figure out where they're at and all the other stuff that you need to track down. So it's a little bit like Battleship to go along with all that craziness. Um, yeah, it's a different take. It's a much less expensive take uh, on uh, this type of game, but it does give you a lot of the uh, fun of the social deduction part. It does give you a lot of the fun of the semi-cooperative part and um, it doesn't have the extra cost of having you know big old boxes full of plastic so if you were looking for a cheaper version that had those qualities this is your, your chance to get that kind of space game and then sometimes you just see a weird product that could be used in uh, video or in, not, not video games in board games twiddle spin is a kinetic desk gaming gadget similar to a fidget spinner but you can pop out uh, different discs to make different decisions. And it's just a weird, quirky gadget that has a ball bearing inside that allows you to um, have different types of randomization. And you can see all the different types of um, uh, discs. Some of them are replacements for dice. Some of them are just words that uh, make them up uh, you could have a north, south, east, east, west. You can't decide on the direction. You can spin it out that way, and then it'll come, pop up with a uh, some type of um, decision for you. There's different types of uh, roulette wheels and other things that could also be included. It's just a quirky gadget if you're into that kind of thing, and a lot of people are because they've already bid over $10,000 for it. And then we've got the Olympics coming up, which is kind of neat and uh, swimming is a part of that so why not have a swimming board game that goes along with it um, you can work you can practice you can enter competitions this is a uh, fairly unexplored territory I don't know much about swimming other than Michael Phelps eats a whole lot of calories and I wish I could be in his level of shape and eat that much pizza so uh, you know but that dude works it off he's like Batman in the workout routine so you know crazy uh, yeah, I can swim. I hope a lot of you guys can as well. And uh, then you'll recognize how comp competition swimming goes. You can sit there and play it. Um, it's more than just sitting there on a kickboard and learning how to hold yourself up. Uh, but that's as far as I am aware on swimming. I'm not fast, but I float and I enjoy myself when I'm in the water. And then I come out all sunburned looking like a lobster because um, I, 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 uh, I do that because I'm pale as, as hell. Then we have Shore Anglers, and this is a game about fishing. You can uh, play it solo, which is nice, 30 minutes uh, per player, and it's a pretty simple uh, age six and up game. I don't know if you can get a six-year-old to play it by themselves, but you can give it a shot. Um, yeah, all different types of fish are in there. Some you would eat, some you wouldn't. Jellyfish, starfish, 
not so much, but salmon, octopus, and tuna throw it on a plate and have a good time. Um, it's a little more complicated than playing just regular old uh, go fish, and it could be educational because um, you can describe, you know, what all these different types of fish are uh, to the young person and uh, what type of bait and other things that you can use, rods, reels, differences in the hooks, all that kind of fun stuff before you go out there and uh, go on, uh, you know, put out your waders and throw the, the, the line out. Maybe you're not out there to eat seafood. Maybe you just want to enjoy the zen serenity of, of the wildlife that you throw into a pond. And that's what Koi Garden is about. Uh, this is not the only Koi uh, game, but it's the only one that is specifically named Koi Garden. I forget the ones that were out last year that kind of fit the same niche. Uh, you can get other things like turtles, frogs, butterflies, and... Uh, little uh, dragonflies and snails to go along with it but basically the idea is you're gonna create using cards uh, and tiles in uh, whatever orientation that makes them fit the best the most harmonious and interesting koi pond you can so enjoy yourself that way maybe you'll watch uh, Chandler's wildlife and see what's going on in his brand new uh, big old fish pond he's out there playing with trout and stuff there's no koi because they're carp, which are basically big old goldfish, and they will eat everything. So he's got other things out there. Um, but, uh, yeah, fun channels, other things to watch, things that you can listen to and uh, enjoy as well while you wait for this to arrive and get your zen going. But if that doesn't excite you, what about War in Space? This is for three to six players pushing your luck to manage your resources and become the warring faction that reaches the nearest habitable planet first. The Terra Proxima, the board looks like Chinese checkers. It's pretty simple pieces, nothing uh, out of the ordinary and uh, crazy. There are some um, different meeples that you can pick. Long range cruisers, scout ships, and a base. Very simple pieces. Uh, you're gonna do the best you can to populate the solar system of Terra Proxima and uh, you can do research you got EMPs to fight the other um, uh, ships uh, and that's basically it ship to ship combat pretty simple nothing too uh, too crazy um, no min uh, minis or anything like that attached but uh, you can upgrade that in the future. I do think that it will have a, a little bit of a difficult time because it's competing against those minis games and it doesn't have any like really cool looking ships that are in plastic. Um, that would be really, really helpful here. Very, very similar is Space Plague where you are going to be an alien uh, of some type, a virus, animal, whatever the case is, but you're gonna become a plague, be you a tribble or whatever, uh, making your way out and it's doing a little better than the previous uh, Terra Proxima game uh, there's a lot more components involved uh, although it does use simple counters and jewels and things like that but there's a lot of card art and things like that uh, as well um, uh, a little card extenders depending on how you play um, there's uh, lots of interesting uh, ideas for the types of creatures and it does a good job of separating them out even though it does use green red purple and uh, blue which could throw off a colorblind person uh, that's one thing that um, they, they need to kind of work on <laughs> there but uh, yeah it's the same kind of game you're out there stretching your your tentacles through the galaxy and uh, finding your way to um, take over so Pick one game, pick the other. If you want the one that's simpler, you want the one that's a little more cartoony. These are out there for you, along with hundreds of others. I know it's hard to choose. And finally, we have Moonera. This is Clash of Champions. It's a two-player card game about being a gladiator. So if you didn't like the other gladiator game, you got this one. This one, though, has Gilbert Gottfried doing some of the, uh, the voices of it. So if you are a fan of his... Um, I have a couple albums of his actually, so that part's pretty neat, but I'm sure he did it for the money. Um, they are uh, a little on the cartoony side, so it's not like the game from Italy as much, but um, it very much feels like arena combat, even though it is just the cards. You can check them out, see how it's going. There is, um, a, uh, the, I don't think playing cards are gonna be part of the final result. I think that was just part of their, their demo for the, a prototype. 
really not that many people are interested in the in prototypes and it can be confusing so I wouldn't necessarily continue with that tactic but these guys have just uh, come out on the market and it's actually doing okay for just being up for a few hours and uh, hopefully it'll do better all right so that's 42 or 43 campaigns just in uh, eight, the ones that have been released in the last week or two um, to uh, to play so if someone wants to try to tell you that there's only 18 games out there liars liars you can tell them that or you can subscribe to me and you come back and you'll see all the games and fun stuff that's out there and you can make a decision for yourself and uh, I'm glad for all the people that continue to do so and continue to like share and subscribe thank you guys very much hello to the new people and uh, welcome back for everybody else and I guess I'll see you on the RPG videos, plural, because there are twice as many campaigns from what you see here as what will be on the next couple episodes just because I think people have been bored and they really want to finish those projects that they worked on during their lockdown time. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. I get my uh, vaccination shot, first shot on Monday. Um, so that'll be cool. I uh, hope everybody will be able to get there soon. Uh, California has been doing pretty well. And if you have anybody that's um, on the fence, that you're not sure if they want to get it or whatever the case is, just get yours first. It's like the mask in the, uh, the airplane. If the thing loses oxygen, you put yours on first and then go get uh, help them with theirs. And uh, you'll be able to say, well, I don't have any problems. I got mine. It's perfectly safe. I didn't get COVID, blah, 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 blah. And uh, go from there. So, you know, hopefully for everybody. Thank you. I'll see you on the next episode.